Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith, God. And Lord, today, we overflow with your goodness, God. So good to be in your house, good to be in your presence, Lord. Truly, wherever you are, God, that's heaven to us, Lord. It wouldn't be heaven without Jesus. And so we thank you that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, that he's on the throne and that everything's gonna be all right. Today, Lord, as we approach your word, we pray that you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, today, we, we just look to you, the true teacher of the church. Not a man, not a woman, not the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. It's about us coming together and hearing from you. So be welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. The Lord will praise you and thank you for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field building your kingdom. So God, we bless all the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, Harvest, Oak Valley, Oasis, for uh, the well and the way, God, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, all the great churches that are out there, God, too many to name by name, God. We bless them as you bless us, God. We bless victory in the four square denominations, God, the Assemblies of God, Lord, uh, the, the Catholic brothers and sisters, Adventist brothers and sisters, the Sabbatarians, God, all those that are naming Jesus as Lord, we bless them as you bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. 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 Today, get your Bibles and go with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter once again. This is defining faith, part number five. We've been in a series talking about defining faith. Now, not only defining what faith is, even though we've done that in this series, but seeing how faith literally defines us. While you're turning to Hebrews the 11th chapter, let me rewind your thinking a little bit. And for those of you that are new, you'll be able to catch up right where we're at today and be able to get the word of the Lord for your heart today. First off, we saw what faith is. If you remember, we found out that there is a biblical definition of faith. Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse number one, that says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we found out that faith is, is literally a conviction. It's our beliefs. And that it has to be founded on the word of God. If it's founded on anything else, then it's presumption and it's not gonna work. Then we ask the question, well, then if that's how, what faith is, how does faith come? Now we read in Romans the 10th chapter, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So whatever we hear and we accept as true, you've got to receive it in your heart and accept that that's truth. That is the word of God for my life, that faith now rises on the inside of us. And that's how we build faith in our lives. Last time we were, uh, two weeks ago we were together, we found out that our faith must be released, that literally we cannot hold on to it and do nothing with it. That's a dead faith because faith without works is dead. Therefore, we have to let our faith go. We have to release it like a seed planted into the ground, that it's got to go out from us and we've got to do accompanying works with our faith. And then finally, last time we were together, we learned that our faith must be fed, that if we're going to continue in faith, that we can't just expect that just because we heard the word one time and just because we believed it, it, that that's enough. No, we got to do something with it, yes. But also, in order to build faith and increase faith and, and to feed our faith, we have to go back to the same scriptures that formed our faith, and we've got to feed on those things as well as feed on God's faithfulness. Just like we release our faith by what we say and do, now we feed our faith by what God says and what God did. Brilliant message, by the way. If you didn't get any of those messages, you can go to the CD counter and get the CDs or they're online absolutely free and you can catch up where we're at in a deeper level. So good. Today, I want to talk to you about our faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, notice on the overheads, I've highlighted the word hope for. In other words, we have a hope. There's a destination. There's somewhere that we are going in our faith faith and in our lives. And then it says the evidence of things not seen. Now we already talked about that, that it's not something that we can calculate in the natural. This is not something we're going to be able to view or understand in the natural sense, but that our faith, we hear the word of God and we believe it. Therefore, we know that it's going to come to pass. So there's a direction we're going. And if we're going to be going anywhere in life, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Therefore, faith must be allowed to be the leader. Got that up there on the overheads for you. Faith must be allowed 
to be the leader. Now we know that the Holy Spirit is our guide, that ultimately Jesus is the captain of our salvation and that God is our aim. Therefore, what do we mean by faith must be allowed to be the leader? If God's the leader, then, then, then what does that mean? Faith must be allowed to be the leader. Well, really, we talked about it, faith in God, right? That our faith is grounded in the truth of God's word and in no other. And it's based on who God is and what God has said and what God has done. Therefore, our faith is leading us towards God. Mark chapter 11, turn there with me. Gospel of Mark chapter 11. I want to show this to you in the word of God. Mark the 11th chapter, while you're turning there, let me set the stage for you. Jesus and his disciples are traveling into Jerusalem. As they're walking into Jerusalem, they see there's a fig tree by the, by the roadside. Now, Jesus must have liked figs. He was going to go and get himself some figs off this tree because he saw leaves on the fig tree. Now, leaves on the fig tree, the, the fruit normally forms first or forms at the same time as the leaves on the fig tree. Therefore, when Jesus walked up to this fig tree and he saw all the green leaves on it, he said, there has to be fruit. So he starts to examine the fig tree, starts to look around, starts to check it out, you know, he's looking all around, and he doesn't see a single fig on the tree. Now, Jesus gets frustrated and kind of, you know, why are you tricking me, tree? Now, I'm paraphrasing now, but that was kind of the attitude I believe that he had. You know, what's going on with this? You've got all these leaves, you should have fruit, and yet there's nothing to satisfy me here. And so Jesus opens his mouth, and he curses the fig tree, and he says, may you never bear fruit again. Wow. Wow. Now, the disciples, you know, the disciples, they watched everything Jesus did. So they were listening when Jesus cursed this fig tree. And so they, they, they noted it. They watched. They waited. And then when Jesus kept going into Jerusalem, they followed him. So the, they go back home that night. And then the next day, they're walking back into Jerusalem. And as they're walking back, Peter looks over and he sees the fig tree, all the disciples too, and is withered up from its roots. So Peter kind of being the, the big mouth, you know, he opens up his mouth. And he says, Jesus, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And this is where we pick up the story in Mark, the 11th chapter, verse number 22. We're going to read through verse number 24. Mark 11, verse 22 says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Everybody say, have faith in God. Verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, the very next verse, verse number 24, starts with the word therefore. Therefore is there for a reason. In other words, because of what I just said about having faith in God, and because of what I just said about being able to speak to a mountain, and that mountain being removed, if you don't doubt, but you believe what you said will come to pass, that it will happen in your life. Therefore, because of that, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now, if ever in the Bible there was a formula for faith, I would say that this verse right here is the formula for faith. That you ask, you believe, and you receive. That's it. Three points. Now, we get mad at that because oftentimes that's not our experience. We've asked and we haven't gotten it. Now, there's reasons why prayers don't get answered. There's reason why our faith may not be working. Or there might be a delay. There might be something going on behind the scenes that we don't understand. Maybe we're asking amiss. Maybe we're asking not according to the will of God. Maybe God has it for us, but it's not the right time yet. But we get frustrated with that, and therefore we, we say, no, Pastor, it can't be that simple. Don't give me three points in a poem. I don't like that. You know, I, I, I think it's, you got to complicate that for me, Pastor. you gotta, you got to make that so hard that I, I feel good about not getting my prayers answered. And yet God says, this is not something that I'm going to complicate for you. It's easy. It's simple. It's so simple that I'm going to give it to you in terms that you can understand, and I'm going to give it to you in a way that you can do it, and then I'm going to empower you by my spirit and by my grace in order to receive the results of it. And so God is saying to us, this faith thing is simply believing, simply asking in faith, believing that we receive, and then we will have those things. Now, it may take some time. There may be circumstances. It may not come the way that we wanted it, but God is faithful and true, and he will watch over his word to make sure that it comes to pass. Are you listening today? So we have to be led by faith because it takes faith. Think about it. If I was to walk everyone outside right now, and we all looked at the mountain ranges here in San Bernardino, San Bernardino mountain ranges, and we looked up there and we saw those mountains, we would all kind of be a little intimidated, right? Those are big mountains. 
I, I mean, one of the, the tallest peaks in Southern California is right over here. And, and so looking at that, that's kind of insurmountable. That's, that's one of those great obstacles. And so for us to look at that, what if, what if it doesn't happen? What if I look foolish? What are people going to think of me? What if God's not in this? And there's all these things that would come against us. And yet Jesus is saying, have faith in God. In other words, if you know it's God's will for you to speak to that mountain, you can stand on God's word and you can boldly declare the will and the counsel of God and regardless of what it looks like on the outside, how long it takes, what happens, God is faithful and true and will bring it to pass. So you have to be led by your faith to do that. Let me illustrate it to you up on the overheads. I've got a video for you, okay? This is an Olympic rowing team. It's actually two teams that you see, one in red and one in blue. Uh, it's either Germany, because the title of the, the video said Germany wins, but then when they got to the finish line, it said Poland and Ukraine. So it's some guys from over there, okay? Now, I want you to notice these guys are straining against the oars, and then see this guy in the back right there in the hat? Okay, he's got the little whistle in his mouth, or, or he's got the little uh, microphone in his mouth, and he's talking to him, right? He's giving him direction, giving him orders. Uh, he, he's giving him the course and that sort of a thing. Now, these guys are responding to that guy in the back that's talking to them. They're all pulling together, they're in unity, and they're able to strain at the oars because that guy is giving them the direction. If they were to get off course, if they started going, drifting a little bit over, he would be able to correct their course and tell them, no, you're going too far to the right, okay, strain to the oars to the left, you know, and that way it'll pull you over that direction. He'd be able to tell them, strain harder, these guys in the red are beating you, you better hurry up, you better pull harder, right? And so he's giving the direction. See, in our lives, it's like that, because notice the guy that's straining against the oars, can he see where he's going? Do they see their destination? But they know that they're headed towards it, right? They know that there's forward momentum going, right? So when they got in that boat, they turned their backs on their destination, and now it's no longer a thing of sight, it's a thing of strength. And they are responding to the captain in that boat. They're responding to the words that are being spoken. It's the same thing in our lives. When we got in the boat with Jesus, now we no longer see our destination. Now it's an unseen thing. And by faith, we put our back into it. We put our strength into it. We respond to the word of the Lord. We hear the voice of the Spirit. Don't turn to the right or to the left, but follow my voice. You can take that down. Thanks, you guys. 2 Corinthians, you remember the, the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7, that says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. See, this isn't a natural thing that you're going to see. You have to turn your back on the things of this world and start to put your back into it. Start to follow by faith, hearing the voice of the Lord, following the commandments of God. That's how faith leads us. Not that faith is the leader, God is the leader, but now we are led by faith, putting our backs into it. Faith sees what I don't. Faith takes me by the hand when I'm blind and walks me through the obstacle course. Faith keeps me safe and steady and steadfast. Augustine said, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Isn't that a cool saying? Once again, St. Augustine said that faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. So what are you believing for? A better question is, who are you believing for those things? See, there's one thing to believe for something. I could believe for prosperity in my finances. And yet, that'll only get me so far. But when I start to get a hold of the Word of God and I start to believe God for my finances, now all of a sudden everything changes because my faith is in God. Jesus said, have faith in God, right? Same thing with my healing. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were, they were needing some healing in their body and they said, I'm not believing for my body to be healed. I'm believing in God who can heal my body. Quite a different thing. Because it's not founded on that thing, it's founded on the Word of God, and God looks after His Word to perform it. That's how we are led by faith in our lives. Are you listening today? So then, faith is the leader in the sense that it leads us to respond to the Word of God. It's that energy, it's that strength, it's that backbone in our lives that we can strain against the oars as we hear the Word of God. So faith should lead what I think, say, and do. Got that up there on the overheads for you. Faith should lead what I think, what I say, and what I do. Ultimately, if you think about this for a moment, if we are walking by faith, not by sight, 
we're following the commands of God, then it's going to impact what we think about. It's going to impact what goes on up here. And what we think about now will spill out of our mouths because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth... Is there only three people that know that scripture? <laughs> Let's try it again. Okay, you didn't come to spectate today. You came to participate. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speaks. Speaks. And what we say has a direct impact on what we do. Now, we will take a look at this more and more as we go on throughout the day. Okay? If we're not being led by faith in God and His Word, then the only alternative is that we're being led by something else. That means that if we're not being led by faith, we have to be being led by the flesh. Is that right? See, the flesh is going to rise up and tell us, oh, no, that's not going to work. You can't see with your physical eyes how it's going to happen. You don't know, oh, look at the symptoms are still there. Uh, there's no money in the bank account. Uh, the kids are still off doing their own thing. Uh, you know, uh, you don't feel like it. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Uh, you know what? Uh, are you sure? And see, then the devil comes in and he starts to rack your brains and he starts to call into question the word of God. Has God really said that? Did God really say by his stripes you were healed and that meant physical healing? Doesn't that just talk about salvation? I mean, is God really concerned with whether or not you've got the sniffles? And all of a sudden, doubt, fear, and unbelief come in, and we're led by the flesh, we're led by fears, and we're no longer walking in faith. Now we turn our back. If our back's not to the world, now our back is to God, and we're going in the wrong direction. And so we have to be led by faith. Faith must be allowed to be the leader. We have to say no to the flesh, Say yes to the word of God. Say no to the devil and tell the devil, get the hell out of my life. Now, some of you in this room are probably thinking, Pastor, did you just cuss in church? No, I did not. Hell is a real place, okay? And hell is not allowed in my life. Therefore, devil, you want to try and bring hell into my life? No, get the hell out of my life. Are you listening? You tell that devil that's where he can go. He can go to that place. Go to hell, devil. To hell with the devil. That's, that's why we stand up and we say no to the flesh. We say no to the devil. We cast him out in Jesus' name. And then we get in faith and we follow the will and the way of the Lord. Regardless of what we see. Regardless of how it looks. Regardless of if we can add it up or not. If we have the word of God, then we know that we can do it. I love what Charles Kettering, the head of uh, GM Research back in the day when they were building uh, cars and that sort of thing, and they had slide rules. Anybody remember slide rules? Some of you guys slide what? Okay, it was like the calculator of their day. And he had a table outside of the research room that when they came in to have their meetings and, and to dream up and invent and that sort of thing, he had a table out there that said, leave your slide rule here. Because he knew that if they got that slide rule inside of the room and they started talking about some new design, changing something up, there'd be a guy reaching for a slide rule. All of a sudden, he'd be sitting there like this for a second, and all of a sudden, he'd be on his feet. Boss, we can't do that, you know? And so he said, leave the slide rule at the door because when I talk and when I dream, this is going to happen, and you can't calculate it out right now, but we're going to cause it to come to pass. And they were able to go farther in GM research than anybody else. See, in our lives, it's the same thing. If you've got the word of God, then you know that you can have those things which you're asking for. Have faith in God. See, Jesus is not calling us to a natural sense. Jesus is not calling us to calculations. No, Jesus is calling us to the same faith that he exemplified when he cursed the fig tree and it dried up at its roots. He's calling us to that same faith that lives out its life in obedience when he went to the cross and he stretched out his arms and he died for us. Remember, Jesus was in the garden and what happened in the garden? Here he is, he's praying and he's looking ahead down the road and he knows that he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to get beat. He knows he's going to be bloodied. He knows that he's going to be crucified. He knows that it's going to be painful. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be scorned. People are going to spit on him. And, 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 and he knows above and beyond that that for the first time ever, he's going to be separated from the Father. That that fellowship that he's enjoyed from eternity past to the present, that that's going to be broken because God cannot look on sin. And he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he knew that when sin was poured out on him on the cross and the wrath of God was poured out, that the Father would turn his head from him for the first time ever. And he knew that that would be agonizing and painful and that there would be rejection, bitter. And so he prays in the garden. What does he pray? God, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. What is he doing? 
He's turning his back on the natural situations. And now he's putting his strength into the will of God. See, that's the faith that Jesus modeled for us in our lives. That even though I know i got to swear to my own hurt, even though I know that the road may be rough, even though I know that it could be painful for me, I know that God is faithful and therefore I'm going to put my back into it and I'm going to get in faith. Got to believe against all odds. Hallelujah. So let's talk about this for a second. Faith must be allowed to be the leader. It must lead what I think, what I say, and what I do. Let's talk about what I think, what I think. Turn to me the book of Proverbs, talking about what I think. Proverbs, right after the book of Psalms, you'll find Proverbs. Go to chapter number four. Proverbs chapter four, we're going to take a look at verse 20 through verse number 22. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 starts out and says this, My son! You say, Pastor Dan, I'm a woman. That's okay, you're still a son. Did you know that? The Bible says we're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So ladies, you are a son in the spiritual realm. But that's okay because the men have to deal with being the bride of Christ, all right? So we're all in this together, okay? The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, spiritually, okay? So my son, my daughter, give attention to my words. What is that? Give attention. Think about it. Listen up. Focus. Give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. See, faith should impact what we think. Notice the next verse. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Now, is this a natural sight? Please tell me. Somebody knows the answer in this room. Is this a natural sight he's talking about? No. It's not a natural sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Therefore, this is the eye of faith that is focused on the word of the Lord. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Now, we want the life. I know I want the life. I want to live the God life. I want to live a blessed life. I want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. I want to live a life that is prosperous and successful. Every area of my life in finances and business, in the community, in my witness, in my marriage and with my children, in my personal purity and holiness, faith and hope and trust and love. I want to live that God life. So the word of the Lord is life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Physically, health in our physical bodies, our flesh. So it all is determined by what we are thinking about up here because what you think will affect what you speak and what you speak will affect what you do. We'll see this as we go today. So let's go back to verse number 21. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So we need to have the word of the Lord rolling around in our heart. We need to be feeding our faith with the word of God that built our faith to begin with. And we need to keep it going on the inside of us. What does that mean? It means we need to meditate on it. We need to keep it rolling around. We need to think about it. We need to bring it back up again and again and again and again and again and again and again. How do we do that? Well, let me describe it to you like this. We are three-part beings. We're made in the image of God, right? Now, we understand that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three parts, and yet our God is one God, right? So God is one, and yet there are three expressions of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we understand this about things in the natural, like an egg, right? It's got the shell, it's got the white, and it's got the yolk. We know that. That's one egg, and yet there are three parts of that one egg, three expressions to that one egg. We see that also in bullets and all that kind of other stuff. There's many illustrations of this, that it may be three things, and yet all one thing, okay? But so it's three expressions, but one God. Our God is one. In the same way, we may be one, but as humans, we are made in the image of God, and there are three parts to our lives as well. There is the physical body that we see, okay? In the natural, we can see the physical body. We can see the flesh. But did you know that that's not you? When you look on the outward appearance of somebody, that's just a tent. That is just the housing, for the person, you say, oh, pastor, I get that because, you know, my body is not what I think about. My body's not what I understand and know and, and my mind, my will, and my emotions. Okay, so that's got to be the real me, right? It's still not the real you. Because the Bible talks about the hidden man of the heart. That beyond that soul realm of mind, will, and emotions, that there is a spirit realm. That's the deepest part of who you are. That's the real you. Is that unseen man living in the heart. There is a spirit man who has a mind, a will, and emotions, has a soul, and lives in this physical body. We are three-part beings. That spirit is what died when you sinned. Hello? 
That's why you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Even though you'd be walking around in the flesh and your mind, will, and emotions were still going, your spirit man died when sin entered in because the commandment put him to death. Therefore, when you believed on Jesus Christ and you were born again, your spirit man was that which was born again and now raised again to life with Jesus Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places, and now the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you, and that's where God speaks to you is in the voice of the Spirit in your conscience. So your heart, when the Bible describes the heart, the Bible is describing that is the seat of your mind, your soul, and of your spirit, the real you. Now where the Spirit of God speaks to you is in your heart. So he says, keep them in the midst of your heart. Now I've got an image for you I want to put up on the overheads, okay? This describes what we just talked about. So if this is you, talking about the heart realm, it's the seat of your soul and your spirit. You notice when the soul and the spirit get together that what happens? You get life. See that over there on the right? Light, love, hope, and faith. That that's life. That's true life. That's the life God wants us to live. So if we can keep our spirit where the word of God is being communicated to us on a spiritual level and we can keep our mind in line with the things of the spirit, then we're going to have life, the God kind of life. But the moment that our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions link up with our body, the flesh, we are no longer being led by faith. We are being led by the flesh and now death produces in our life. Lust, sin, desires, and passions of the flesh. Now, we know that if we walk in the flesh, we are not pleasing to the Lord, but if the body and the soul link up, man, oh, I don't feel good. You're in the flesh. Oh, I don't understand how that's going to calculate out. I'm worried. Flesh. Oh, my goodness, I'm so hungry and I just can't stop eating. Flesh. Oh, look at that woman. I just want it. Flesh. But when we link up with soul and spirit now, we can say no to the devil and we can say no to the flesh, right? I may feel this way, but the word of God says. I may see this, but the word of God says. It doesn't look good, but the word of God says. And therefore, we can say no to the devil and we can say yes to the spirit and to the word of God. Okay? Now, notice the body and the spirit can't link up. They're at war with one another. Okay? So that's why it takes us to mentally get in line with the Spirit. We have to catch ourselves. Oh, I was in the flesh. No, I'm going to cross over and I'm going to get in the Spirit. Why? Because they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So when the soul and the Spirit link up, it's going to benefit your body. Hello. Now we can take that down, guys, and move on to the next part. Okay? It's going to affect what I think. What I think will have a direct impact on what I say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as we get the word of God rolling around up here, now all of a sudden it's going to start to exit here. What I say is a seed. Everything that I say is a seed. And what you sow, you will reap. I can sow good seed or I can sow bad seed. Everything I say in life is a seed. Now, in the natural, we understand that if you sow weeds... Weeds will spring up real quick, is that right? But if you sow trees, fruit trees, then it's going to take you years probably to get good fruit. It's a process. It's going to take much longer. Let me give you a natural example of this. You wake up in the morning. You woke up way too early. Alarm hadn't even gone off yet. Sun is still hiding behind the mountains. And you think, oh gosh, what am I doing up? This is just going to be a bad day. And you start to get up and you can't get to sleep, so you get up and you're grumbling. Oh, it's going to be a terrible day. I can't believe that I'm up this early. Get ready and you go to work. The moment you get to work, the boss is on your case. Oh, I knew it. I knew this was going to be a terrible day. And you know what? I don't even feel good. I, I must be sick. So throughout the day, you're coughing, you're sniffling, you're sneezing. Your work isn't that great. The boss is just getting worse and worse. At lunch, you don't want to be around anybody. You're grumping at everybody. And, oh, I just knew this was going to be a terrible day. Nobody wants to be with me. This is just horrible. You go home. Husband or wife is nagging you. And you go, ah, I knew this was going to be a bad day. Now you two come on. Kids come home and they're just running amok, not doing what they should be. And start yelling again. You kids are not going to amount to anything. God, I knew this was going to be a bad day. And so that night you go and you lay down to bed, you can't even sleep because you, your body's hurting and your mind is just racing. And you say, goodness, I knew this was going to be a terrible day and tomorrow's going to be bad too. And you wake up the next day and you have a terrible day the next day. <laughs> Why? Because those weeds that you were sowing are growing real fast in your life. Happens so quick. Now you say, pastor, 
I don't believe in what those preachers say that you can have whatever you say. Well, then you don't believe the Bible because James, the third chapter, says that are not ships, mighty great ships, steered by a little rudder, right? If you go out and look at the Queen Mary, look at the size of the ship versus the size of the rudder. It's a little member of that ship. Same way as our tongues. We put bits in the mouth of horses, James says, and we can turn them wherever they go. That is a massive, muscular beast with a mind of its own, and yet you can turn that horse wherever you want him to go with a bit in his mouth. Same thing with your tongue. You can direct your life wherever you want to go because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And you are ensnared by the words of your mouth, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. Therefore, if you start to speak death, because your mind is linked up with your flesh and you speak the weeds instead of the good seeds, then you're going to have what you say. But let's say you wake up in the morning way too early and you say, you know what? God must be waking me up for something good today. I believe that this is the day that the Lord has made and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. And you get up and, oh, you know what? You know what? I, I don't feel good. Oh, wait a second. Wait, wait. It's a good day, but I don't feel good. But I'm not going to go by what my flesh is. Oh, nobody. By his stripes you were healed. And therefore, he sent forth his word and he healed me. And I'm walking in the blessings of God today. I have the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. And therefore, I'm not going to allow body. You better line up with the word of God. And you sow that seed in yourself. Then you get to work. You get to the work and your boss is on your case. Wait a second, I thought problems would go away if I just talked. No, the problems are still there. The day is no different. But guess what? You're different. Right? Because you're sowing the right seed. Boss starts getting on your case and you say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Why? Because I'm not working for you. I am working unto the Lord. And therefore, the Lord is watching after my work. And he will prosper me in everything I put my hand to go throughout the day and people still don't want to sit next to you because you're a radical Christian. You brought your Bible to work and you set it there on the table, but you don't care. Hey, I'm a God. I sick the spirit of God on them. I just call in laborers into the harvest field. God, use me to reach these people. And someone's marriage is falling apart and they're crying over there in the corner and you go and you minister to them and you pray with them. Someone else starts needing you say, brother, can I lay hands on you and pray for you to be healed? And they say, well, I guess it couldn't hurt. I, I you know, I haven't even met an atheist who will turn down prayer. Come on, somebody. I uh, couldn't hurt. Bring it on, all right? Yeah, and you just lay hands on them. You say, hey, when I lay hands, God's going to hit you. It's not about the hand. It's about God touching you right now. You're going to get healed. And you pray, and you pray the prayer of faith, and you believe God. Listen, what are you doing? You're turning your back on the natural, and you're putting your back into it, right? Responding to the voice of the Lord. You get home, and the husband and wife is still nagging. Still nagging. And what do you do? You say, no, I'm going to submit to that man as the church is subject to Christ in all things. I'm going to love that woman as Christ loved the church. And all of a sudden, hey, honey, let's get together. Let's pray. Let's believe God. Let's get in agreement. And then the kids come home. They're not doing what they should be. And you say, oh, no, my children are disciples. Taught of the Lord. Great shall be their peace. And they're undisturbed. Composed. Kids, get over here. And you start to discipline in a godly way, in a loving way, and you reinforce your discipline with love. You get everybody around the table. You're praying together. You're breaking bread together. And then you lay down, and you're up too late, and you say, oh, no, my Bible promises me sleep. The Bible says he gives the righteous one sleep. That I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. See, you are directing now your life as that rudder on the boat, as that bit in the horse's mouth. We need to do that. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 14, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Stay on the word of God. Be led by faith with the words of your mouth. Are you listening today? So what I say will direct what I do. Last one for today is what I do. See, if we say we can't, then we won't. But if I say I can, then I will. And that's what this is all about, is directing our lives so that we start to go and do the will and the way of the Lord. You're there in Hebrews Four, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 this time. Hebrews chapter 10, we were there probably last year sometime. <laughs> Hebrews 4, I can't even remember how many years ago that was. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23 and 24, look at it with me. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What is that? That's what you're speaking about, the word of God. For he who promised is faithful. That's talking about God. See, my faith is not in myself. My faith is not even in my words. My faith is in God who backs the word. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love 
and good works. Notice right after the words comes the works. I'm reminded of a story in England back in the day before that they had the irrigation systems where you could just turn on the water and sprinkle all your, your crops and that sort of thing. They were having a drought, having a dry season. The farmers had planted their, their seed and there was no rain. And so they went together and they, they gathered up and they said, we've got to do something about this. We need to pray because only God can bring us the rains. So they went to the preacher in town and they said, can you gather everyone up? We want to have a church service out here in the fields. And we want to ask God's blessing and pray for rain. So the pastor put the word out. They gathered up the whole parish. Everybody came out. A little girl named Mary came out with a large umbrella to the prayer meeting. Everybody was kind of laughing. The pastor went over to her and said, Mary, what are you doing? There's not a cloud in the sky. She says, Pastor, we're praying for rain, and then I know God's going to answer. See, what was she doing? She had her faith in God and knew that she was putting her back into it. That's why she brought her umbrella. Do you know as they left that prayer meeting that day, the pastor and the little girl were under the umbrella. Everybody else went home soaking wet. <laughs> Because God answered their prayers that day. I was talking to a guy in our church, and actually I see someone here. I'm not going to point him out, but I uh, but had the same testimony. But I was talking to a guy in our church, and uh, he was having some trou trouble with his mortgages. And, uh, you know, when the bottom fell out, mortgage rates went insane and all that kind of stuff. His mortgage, had a second mortgage on his house, went from 3% to like 10% or something like that. It was 400 times was his bill of what it originally was. He says, I could handle the three, but I cannot handle the 10% interest. That's hundreds of dollars that I just don't have. So he called up the company and said, will you guys work with me? Because, you know, I, I, I love this house and, and I want to stay here. I can pay at this rate. I want to pay. I don't want to cheat you. I don't want to do anything wrong. And, and, and I want to pay. So can you reduce the, the rates to this much? And they said, no, we're going to do a short sale on the house. He said, well, you know what? How much money would you make on a short sale. They said, well, we'd make X amount of dollars. So he calculated that out. He said, well, if you give me this interest rate, you'll get that over the years. You'll actually get more. I'll give you not just that percent. I'll give you, you know, an extra percent on that. Will you work with me and, 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 and get the money and, and you don't have to short sale the house? And they said, no, we're going to foreclose. We're going to short sale the house. He said, well, okay, well, you're going to have to deal with the first on the house. And I don't think, you know, I'm paying them. So I don't think that they're going to do that. So he, he got off the phone with them, and they were harassing him. He sent them cease and desist letters. But the whole time, he knew that God had given him this house. And he said, Lord, this is the house that you gave me, God, and I don't know what's going on. And God said, just, just believe me. Just believe me. Stay in faith. So he said, okay, God, I'll just, I'll just stay in faith. So then, as the years went by, a couple of years every day, he'd come home, and he'd be looking for that pink note on the door. He'd drive into his house, and he'd be looking at the door, and God started to correct him and say, why are you looking on the door? Didn't I tell you I was going to give you this house? I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. But every day, every day, every day driving in, he'd be looking at that door. And every day, the Lord would remind him, this is your house. I gave this house to you. Believe me. So then as houses go, you know, things start to fall apart. Repairs are being need to be made. And he's talking to his wife. Why am I going to fix that? Why am I going to repair that if we're not even going to be staying in this house? She said, did God give us this house? <laughs> You're right, you're right. So he go and fix it. Water heater breaks. He goes out to the store and he's looking at water heaters. He's got to have hot water, right? And so he's looking at it and he's going, man, I don't want to spend all this money on a water heater that I may not even get to enjoy in this house. And the Lord checked his heart and said, didn't I say I gave you this house? Yes, Lord, you did. Then buy the water heater that you would want in your house. Okay, Lord. So he goes and he buys the better water heater, installs it in his house. He had a very dark day uh, through some circumstances in his life. And on that day, he got a letter in the mail from the company on the second mortgage on his home. He thought, here it is. You know, here we go. So he opened it up. And as he looked at the paper, his jaw dropped. Because on that paper, it had the full mortgage amount. And it said, paid in full, debt is forgiven. In our lives, we need to believe God enough to turn our back on the natural situation. To spend to get the better one for our life and not settle for less. Not allow the flesh to talk us out of it or the devil to lie to us. But to say no to the flesh, say no to the devil, meditate on the word of God, be led by faith in our thinking, in our words, directing our life wherever we turn it, and in our actions. You guys get something from the word of the Lord today? Come on. Let's shout unto God. Hallelujah. God is good. Woo. Hey, I want to talk to you guys about your life before you leave. I want to talk to you about your hearts. You know, you're talking about the heart today. Learn some things. Maybe that was the first time some of you ever heard that. 
But I want to talk to you about your heart because if your heart's not right and you die, you're not going to make it to heaven. You're going to end up in hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, isn't that convenient? Because the Bible talks about hell. Did you know that? Old and New Testament, Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And just by denying hell's existence doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of it. It wasn't made for you or me. It was made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And yet, God loves us so much, he gave us a free will choice with our lives while we're here on the earth, whether we will believe him for our salvation or reject him and go to hell. Because God doesn't want to be with people who don't want to be with him. And so sometimes people say, well, you know, all roads lead to heaven, Pastor. I don't have to worry about that. God is loving and kind. And, you know, Jesus went to the cross so that all could go. And, uh, you know, all roads now lead to heaven. doesn't matter what you do. Just you do your thing. I'll do my thing. You know, as long as we all stay true to ourselves. The church is out there. They got their thing in their way. And that's cool for them. And God sees that and appreciates that. And he's going to let us all in. But the problem with that is that nowhere in the Bible say God's just going to let everybody into heaven just do whatever you want to do. Not all roads lead to heaven. That's like me saying all roads lead to the moon. Listen, you could drive around the earth as long as you want and you will never make it. One way you're going to have to make it. You can't get there your way or my way or someone meaning church committee's way. You've got to get there God's way. God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So it's God's heaven got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, God's way is by being good, right? I've been a really good person, cleaned up my act, used to be bad, now I'm good. My good really outweighs my bad, and I think God notices that, and he's going to let me in because I've been good. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven? Because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to make it just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes and I wore religious jewelry. Maybe I had a t-shirt that said Jesus. And you're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say your parents raised you in church tell you a Christian that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible just say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry or t-shirts or any of that kind of stuff. Be baptized a Christian as a child or because you're born in America that you get to go to heaven. Doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven denying your presence in hell. Come on, listen up because your eternal life's at stake. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, you know what that's like saying? That's like saying, well, I believe I'm a Dodger. And I go and I buy a Dodger uniform. Drive down to Los Angeles, sit in the Dodger dugout. Bring my bat and my ball and say, I'm a Dodger and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a Dodger. I didn't get there the right way. Same thing. You can't just call yourself a Christian, sit in a church service, and expect to go to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second. My last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church, volunteered all over the place, pastor, even got a membership card. You were talking about membership, right? I got a membership card. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, no. Could you show me in the Bible where God is logging your volunteer hours at church in order for you to get to heaven? It's not there. God is not looking for your membership card to a church like he's, you know, the, the old man at Costco or Sam's Club waiting for you to come in and show him your card. God's not doing that. Can't just get to heaven just because you volunteer in church or because you're a member. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I get all that, but you don't understand. I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I can quote scriptures to you, Pastor. Doesn't that count for something? Sure it does. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But if you'd read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here. Look up. Look. Look. Right here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the cold, caused all kind of confusion about it. But listen, it's not about what books, Hollywood, movie, television, and the internet say. It's about what Jesus says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. We prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. 
Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I want to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like this, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that today because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than just to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment? Come on. And yet your flesh going to try and tell you, no, don't do this. What are people going to think? The devil's going to whisper in your ear, has God really said, is this really true? Is this real? Or is this just emotions? Listen, you put the flesh under it, tell the devil to go to hell. Go we'll jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God today. Get ready to get your hands up. All across this auditorium, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? And you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up, make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All across this auditorium, front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watch by television in the foyer in the Love Rock Cafe get ready to get your hand up God sees God's watching then you can tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service online hey if you're ready to do this you can raise your hand wherever you're at God sees your heart right where you're at and then on our home page click on the button that says respond to God and then someone will lead you in a prayer wherever you're at I'm going to count to three pop my hands together this is your time this is your moment of salvation here we go one two Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine. Thank you. Who else today? Nine wise people. There's ten up there. Got you over there. Thank you. Ten wise people already. Eleven, twelve, thirteen in the family rooms. Thank you. Fourteen. Got you over there. Thank you. Fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. Who else today? Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen up top. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Thank you. I got you, man. You can put your hand down if I already saw you. Seventeen, eighteen. Got you up there. Thank you. Who else today? 18 wise people. Is there anybody else who's sitting there wondering if you should do this? Yeah, you should. Go for it. Come on, I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Who else today? I just know there's number 19. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Come on, yeah, you should. God's tugging at your heart right now. That you just pop it up high when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? Number 19, come on, where you at? Where you at? Just pop it up high. Who else today? Come on, anybody else? Anybody else? All right, last call. Hey, I'm going to close this thing up. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. One, one last. Thank you, number 19. Oh, don't you know, number 20. You were sitting there waiting. You said, I don't want to be, I want to be number 20. Come on. If that's you, pop it up. You want to be that round number. The, the, who else? Where are they at? Up top, number 20. God bless you. Got you up there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. All right, all 20 of you, or if you're number 21, 22, 23, number 24, and the guy that was waiting to be number 25 too, okay? All of you guys, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, here's what I want you to do. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand. No one leaves during this time. Let them come. And you just come right now. Get your stuff, get in the aisle, get a friend if you need a friend, and meet me up front. Come on down. Let's welcome them as they come. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. 
Come on, come on, come on. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Hallelujah. You can come too from the family rooms. Bring your children down. They'll remember this. From the foyer, if you raise your hand, come on in. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on down. They're still coming. They're still coming. You can come too. Hallelujah. Anybody else, come on down. Come on down. You know you need to do it. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Wow, they're still coming. Come on. We'll wait for you. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Everybody up front, look up here. Can I tell you something? You look good. You do. It's the best decision of your life right here. You can put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, all right? Right over here to my right, your left, waving at you. This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You already got past the preacher. He's about the weirdest one you're going to encounter today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, some free information, free literature. Help find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then he's going to give you absolutely free a friend we have here in the church we call a spiritual personal trainer heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually okay it's easy it's free he'll describe how it works and they'll let you come right back out now let me make a promise to you guys give us a year one year of your life sitting consistently in church under the teaching of God here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center Okay? Applying the word of God to your life. After that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. I promise that you will look around your life and say, my goodness, I did not know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, take their word for it, okay? You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.